try to breathe in a way that feels nourishing to the body. John Lee recommends starting out with some good long, deep in and out breaths as a way of energizing yourself and also emphasizing the process of breathing. So you can see clearly now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And wherever it feels most prominent, focus your attention there. And then ask yourself if it's comfortable. Comfortable can depend on the state of your body right now. If you're feeling tense, you want to breathe in a way that's more relaxing. If your energy level is low, you want to breathe in a way that gives you more energy. So make adjustments as you need. And you may find that the breath will require adjustment several times as the needs of the body change. This is a good test for your alertness, watching what you're doing, watching the results of what you're doing. And then using what you've seen to change what you're doing, if necessary. This is how the process becomes nourishing to the mind. The Buddha says there are two qualities or two activities that nourish the Dhamma. In other words, nourish the Dhamma in you. One is commitment and the other is reflection. You commit yourself to doing this and then you reflect on how well it's going what you've learned. And as we meditate, we're training ourselves in both activities, how to commit in a skillful way, how to reflect in a skillful way. Sometimes you put in so much energy that you wear yourself out. Okay, that's not the right kind of commitment. You want to learn how to pace yourself like a marathon runner. If you sprint for the first hundred meters, you wear yourself out. And then you can't finish the marathon. So what would be a good steady pace to keep? And the important, important part is the steadiness, that you stick with it. And John Vuong had a comment in Thai one time. He said, the Thai is tung tam ben nit, the manrug man nit, which basically means it's a little something that you're doing here, but you have to do it continually. The, Pun is on the word nit, which is spelled two different ways. The little thing, of course, is just being mindful. It's not that difficult to try to remember what, to stay here. The difficult part is remembering continuously. That's the commitment. And then from remembering what you're doing here, remembering to stay here, you're alert and you're ardent. You notice what you're actually doing and the results that you're actually getting. And this is where the reflection comes in. If you have a sense that it's not going well, what can you do to change things? In some areas it's very easy to decide. You've made up your mind to stay with the breath and all of a sudden you find yourself thinking about, what, Los Angeles? Next week, last week. things that are totally unrelated to the breath, you pull yourself back. If it wanders off again, you bring yourself back again. Try not to get discouraged. When you are with a breath, then the question is, does the mind feel snug with a breath? Are you really sensitive to what's going on? Here again, you have to use some reflection. What kind of breathing would be easy for the mind to stay with right now? What kind of breathing would be good for the body right now? You can experiment. And this is how any skill is developed. You do it and then you reflect on the results of what you've done. And John Lee uses this image a lot. He says it's like making a basket. The teacher tells you how to make a basket, the different ways you can weave the wicker. And you go ahead and you weave your first basket. Well, it doesn't look like the teacher's basket at all. It's unbalanced. It's got the wrong proportions. The weave is not all that even. So you reflect on it, and then you go back and you do it again. 
This time you figure out, well, what did I do wrong? You have to observe yourself as you're acting so you can see, oh, this is how, or this is why the weave is not even. This is why the basket gets unbalanced. And you can make adjustments. So this involves two sides of the mind, the side of the mind that does things and the side of the mind that watches things. The side that watches, however, you have to train it so it's not just sitting there watching and not passing any judgment. Sometimes you hear this said that the observer doesn't pass judgment at all, it accepts whatever comes up. That's well, a very lazy observer, except in cases where you don't know what's happening. In other words, you can't interpret what's happening as being either skillful or not skillful, in which case you do just observe and you don't just you don't rush to judgment. In other words, you learn how to be judicious rather than judgmental. And that involves sometimes just watching for long periods of time. Other times you, you know what you should be doing, in which case you bring your knowledge to bear. That's what mindfulness is all about. We're learning lessons as we meditate. It's not the case that every moment is totally fresh and totally unprecedented. Over time you begin to gain a sense of when the breath is too heavy, when the breath is too light, when the mind's focus is in the wrong place, when it's focusing too hard, its focus is so one-pointed that it's actually disturbing the flow of energy in the body. You begin to notice these things, and then you learn how to compensate. If you can't figure out on your own how to conversate, this is, this is why you have a teacher to ask questions. In my time with the John Fu, there are times when I would ask questions and he would just kind of look at me and say, well, can't you solve that problem yourself? Do I have to go back and work on it on my own? Other times he would actually give advice. But the important thing is that you Try to observe on your own as much as you can, so that the observer in the mind, the part of the mind that reflects, becomes more and more reliable. For many of us, the observer inside is way too judgmental, which is why to compensate some people will tell you, well, don't pass judgment at all, just accept whatever comes up. But that's going from one extreme to another. The observer side has to learn okay, when to try to make differences and when to just watch. And this comes with time, as with any skill. So commit yourself to being with the breath for the rest of the hour. Commit yourself to trying to be as comfortable with the breath as you can. Let the breath flow throughout the body. Upai Sikai one of the foremost women teachers in Thailand, used to say, go through and relax all the joints in your body. Think of your wrists, think of your, the joints in your fingers, the joints in your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders. Then go from the toes up to the ankles, the knees, and the pelvis. Breathe in a way that all the joints in the body can stay relaxed all the way in the, with the in-breath, all the way with the out. Have that sense of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out, and your awareness is whole body as well. Fully present. This is the commitment part. And if you fall away, this is when you have to reflect, okay, what, what, what went wrong? Sometimes when the mind falls away, all you do is just get it back where it was. Pick up what you were doing and carry on. Other times, if a particular thought is pulling you away insistently, you have to try other techniques. One is reflecting on how unskillful that thought is, what its drawbacks are. If you were to think it for 24 hours, where would it take you? What would it make you do? You see that it's not worth thinking. It may not necessarily be all that horribly unskillful, but it's a total waste of time. In a case like that, ask yourself, 
If this were a movie, would I pay to watch it? Nine times out of ten, the, the answer is no. And even in the one time out of ten, if you would pay to watch it, is this the right time for that? Or you can just tell yourself, the thoughts can go on, but I'm not going to pay them any attention. This is where it's useful to think about the mind as being like a committee. You have lots of commentators commenting on what's going on, what you should and shouldn't be doing. And you've got to ferret out which is the commentator I want to believe. The one that wants you to stay here, the one that says, okay, they can talk as much as they like, but we don't have to pay any attention to them. Hold on to that commentator. Hold on to that observer in the mind. And get back to the breath. Another technique is like the one we discussed earlier this evening. You realize that distracting thoughts require energy. There's part of the body that will tense up as soon as you start a thought. That's your way of marking the thought so you can keep with it. But you can figure out where in the body the tension comes. And it can come in any part of the body. This is one of the reasons why it's so useful to be aware of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out. Because you might detect, well, there's a pattern of tension that arises, say, in, in your arm, in your pelvis. Okay, relax that tension. And the thought will go away. Or you can try just pressing your tongue against the roof of your mouth, saying, no, I will not think that thought. As the Buddha says, crush your mind with your mind. This is where the Ajahn's in Thailand will say, use a meditation word and do it really fast, you know, like machine gun, budo, 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 or whatever your meditation word might be, just to jam the circuits. So the techniques you can use to get the mind back, once you observe that it's going where it shouldn't be going. You don't just accept the fact, well, today my mind is wandering, I'll just let it wander. That doesn't develop anything in the mind at all. We're here both to let go and to develop. As the Buddha said, this is one of the customs of the Noble Ones, that we delight in developing, delight in abandoning. In other words, we delight in developing skillful qualities. You bring the mind back, and you're happy that you're able to bring it back. You reach a point in the rhythm of the mind where you tend to let go, and this time you don't let go. You hold on to the breath. Okay, delight in that fact. And there are other times you can see that you actually let go of an unskillful thought. Well, delight in that fact, too. The role of delight in the path is an important aspect. As the Buddha said, when you see that you're doing well, take joy in that fact. This encourages you to stick with the practice. And as you realize the range of things you can do, your observer, the part of the mind that reflects on things, has a better and better idea what range of things you can do in, in any given situation. In other words, it's not just one way to deal with distracting thoughts, or there's not just one way to get the mind to settle down. And as you stick with the practice, you find that you gain a sense of what range is really skillful. So we're here to learn a skill. The skill depends on committing yourself to doing the practice as best you can, and then reflecting on it. I mean, this is how the Buddha taught Rahula, his son, from the very beginning. If there's anything you want to do, say, or think, ask yourself before you do it. What do I intend the results of this to be? What do I expect the results to be? If you see that's going to lead to harm for yourself or for others, you don't do it. If you don't see any harm, go ahead and do it. While you're doing it, reflect on the results that are actually coming up, because given the principle of causality, some actions give their results right away. 
You don't you stick your finger into the wood stove, it's not going to be the next lifetime when it burns. If you see that harm is happening, okay, stop. If you don't see any harm, go ahead and continue with the action until you're done. When you're done, you reflect on the long-term results. If you see that there was any harm done, okay, you resolve that. You're not going to repeat that harm. And if you can, if it's an action and thought, excuse me, an action in word or deed, you talk it over with someone else. You would trust on the path. So you can get their ideas of how to avoid that mistake the next time around. But if on reflection you see that you didn't harm anybody at all, then take joy in that fact. This is how you train the part of the mind that reflects. So it becomes a skillful observer. It passes skillful judgment. So the part that's committed to the practice gets better and better advice all the time. And when you do that, it's not just that the breath feels nourishing, but the mind gets nourished as well. And it's nourished not just with a sense of ease and well-being that come with the breath, the sense of refreshment that comes with the breath, but also the realization that it's more and more in charge of its own actions. It's a better and better judge of its own actions. This is a sense of well-being, the happiness that comes from a skill. So we're not just working on pleasant feelings here. We're working on the mind's ability to look after itself, to care for itself. We have that phrase in the chant, may I look after myself with ease. Well, this is how you do it, by committing yourself to do what you know is skillful. And then reflecting on it, so it actually becomes more and more skillful with time. So you're showing goodwill for yourself. You're showing goodwill for the people around you, too. The more skillful you are in tending to your mind, caring for your mind, the fewer burdens you place on others. And the more energy you have to help them with their burdens, if necessary. So this is a kind of goodness and a kind of nourishment that goes all around. Years back when John Sawat was teaching a retreat in Massachusetts, someone who was brand new to the practice said to him one afternoon, you guys would have a good religion here with Buddhism if only you had a god to give you a sense of support when things don't go well in the practice. And John Swat's response was, if there were a god who could ordain that when I eat a mouthful of food, everybody in the world gets full, I'd bow down to that god. Of course, with physical food, you can't do that. But with metal food, the goodness does spread around. The food that comes from commitment, the food that comes from reflection, nurses the dharma in you. And it provides nourishment to other people, too.